Welcome back. Today we continue our series on diffusion image filtering. We're going to start to work on some themes uh, that we will need in order to implement a filter in a realistic software. And the first of these is three diagonal inversion. Look, the context of this, well, if you followed the course up to now, you will see that in the previous videos we derived the Crank Nicholson method to solve the heat equation, and then the Crank Nicholson method was essentially a convolution of the our initial of the, our, of the signal we want to pass through the heat equation with a very small signal with just three numbers, and then we would determine the new signal at the time step delta t as a solution of a linear of a linear system that turned out to be three diagonal right and uh, the reason that uh, we uh, that the subject of today's video is we'll still implement the crank nicholson method but instead of doing the inversion in, in a numerical package in numpy we'll code one ourselves in, in, the, in the C++ programming language. And you might ask, what is the reason for this? Well, it turns out that uh, today graphics cards are very, very popular, and when you are programming in a graphics card, you're in a very restricted environment. You cannot uh, like load Python libraries, for example, that will do the work for you. And uh, and uh, to get the performance of a graphics card, you kind of need to go down to the grid, grid in details. That's what I mean. And it turns out that coding this in C++ will not only like, give us some knowledge of how, about how these numerical methods work, it will also uh, serve as an intermediate step when we want to put something in the graphics card later using OpenCL. All right, without further ado, let's start. So the three diagonal system that we found is like something like this. It has one value in the main diagonal and another one in the secondary diagonal. All right. And what is interesting about this is that we derived, although it has this form like the diagonal, the diagonal is different from the lateral ones. For the problem that we have, this it's still true that the system is three diagonal for a general nonlinear equation because the three diagonal thing refers to the locality of the interaction, right? So if you if you have an equation which is nonlinear, but it is still local in the sense that it only depends on the field at a given point and its derivatives, then you you should expect it to be uh, to, up, to, to reduce your three diagonal matrix when you eventually discretize the system, which is a very good thing. Now you might ask yourself, okay, so let's just do this without NumPy, and we need to do that fast. So how we how would we do this? Well, it turns out that uh, there is like one simple way, which is called Thomas algorithm, I think that you simply do Gaussian elimination of this, right? You say, when you pick this row, all right, you multiply it by minus b divided by a, and you sum it in this one. And this cancels this b term, and then you have this term in the diagonal, and then uh, you keep going, right? And then when you remove all of these b's in the lower diagonal, you get a u n equals v a u n minus 1 equals v n minus 1 then you can solve for u n minus 1 and then you substitute it here and you can find u n minus 2 and so then you go and you go above right the problem with this method is that it well while it is a linear complexity o n complexity you only need you know, like two loops i think to to do this the problem with it is it is numerically unstable because 
Gaussian elimination in general is numerically unstable, right? So you can imagine that at one of if at one of these steps when we uh, eliminate uh, the lower part of the matrix, if we get a number in the main diagonal whose absolute ver value is very very small, uh, very close to zero, then this is problem because to cancel the next row, we might need to multiply by a very large value and the floating point schemes they have a lot of trouble with dealing with this right but in the general sense the solution for this is pivoting so you would like exchange rows or columns to put the number with the highest absolute value in the main diagonal but the problem is that if we do pivoting with this matrix we lose o n complexity right because we only have O n complexity if we do Gaussian elimination in this order, and it might not look like a big deal, but uh, if you like win a matrix with thousands of rows, the chance of of one guy in the diagonal being very very small is very very large, and you only need this to happen once to completely blow up your solution, right? There is another method which I'm just gonna briefly mention here. We're not going to use it. Is more for you to acquire experience because you kind of need to develop an intuition about these methods as a numerical method of what is good and what is bad. They, there's another one called the marching method, which is very interesting. The, the, this row here is put last, all right, and if you see that in that part here, this row here is an upper triangular matrix. And it turns out if you write this in block form you can invert it so that you can find U1 in terms of uh, of this upper triangular matrix that in the text is called R. And then you only need to evaluate R minus 1 uh, at the v bar vector, which is v2 up to vn minus 1, and r minus 1s, which is another column vector that's also easy, right? And the whole idea of this method is that uh, when you evaluate r minus 1 applied to s, this can be done with just back substitution, right? And back substitution for an upper triangular matrix which is banded, uh, it is just O n. Right, but the problem, but this guy also has a problem, is that okay? So you reduce it to only back substitution, which is numerically stable. But it turns out that if you run this method for a matrix which is not diagonally dominant, where the main diagonal is is much larger than the lateral ones, what happens is that these values here, like T R minus one S, T R minus one V it turned out to be very very large right and you can see that if you have to calculate these very very large values and then divide or subtract them to obtain a solution for floating points that's awful because as the value increases the things that you summed all the way below they kinda get lost right because the floating point cannot possibly accumulate so much precision then it will start to drop at some point. And then that's it. This is also O N, also a good idea. It is it is not numerically unstable unstable like Gaussian elimination, but uh, it also has its own problems because of this uh, the we usually call this that the matrix is ill conditioned that the solutions grow so much that one imprecision at a small guy can escalate to a larger imprecision in all of the other values. All right. So then so how we're going to fix this the algorithm that we are going to use it's called cyclic reduction. It is not O n complexity it is O n log n and like I said as a numerical person as a numerical methods person you need to have an intuition about this because Sometimes these methods that they they are linear, but if they involve substituting something and then fetching it back and using that value as in Gaussian elimination, as in back substitution, these methods that are very very difficult to parallelize, 
most of the time they are bad methods, right? Because they, when you're working at floating point, imprecisions arise because you do an operation of the number several, several times. And if your algorithm is linear, but you pick a value and then you need to run several floating point operations on it, you can you can start to think that uh, nothing good will come out of that thing, right? So in this case, it is better to like, okay, we're not going to do linear complexity. We're going to do, do this one, which is O n log n, but uh, we will see that cyclic reduction as opposed to these other two methods that I showed. It is very, very easy to parallelize and also it is somewhat related to this fact is that it also is numerically stable. And in fact, I believe it has been proved that the cyclic reduction is stable if the for any symmetric matrix, which includes the one in our problem. So this is a very, very good method. All right, so let us go here. So what is cyclic reduction? So if we look at, if we pick a matrix like this, right? And we look at three rows, three ad three consecutive rows, okay? And these three rows, they give us three equations for five variables, right? These, these, five here are known, these are in the, the independent variables. And then the idea is that we're going to replace this middle row here, the middle row, okay? We're going to replace the middle row by a combination of the these three, which is given by multiplying with this row vector, right? And if you see these values are chosen so that when we sum this guy here kills this term, which becomes zero, and then this guy here kills this term, which becomes zero. And what's going to happen is that this middle row will transform into something like this. So now, what before we had an equation for xi minus 1, xi, and xi plus 1, now this row represents an equation between xi minus 2, xi, and xi plus 2. And you can see that this is still a trigonal system, but very interesting stuff that we decoupled the system. Now we have a, a trigonal, three diagonal system for the odd numbered var variables and then another three diagonal system for the uh, even numbered variables, right? And these guys don't talk to each other and you can like thing, solve them separately. So by divide and conquer, we can kind of apply the same thing to these uh, two three diagonal systems until we actually have only a diagonal system, which is trivial to solve. Perhaps it would be a good idea to draw this. So let's go. So we have we have here matrix, right? And if we have a three diagonal matrix, it is like this, right? So it is filled here. And here. And here. And here. We go like this. Until we reach here, right? So this is a three diagonal matrix where the circles are all the non-zero terms, right? And what happens is that whenever we run a reduction, that step I showed that pick three, well, it can also run on the border if you assume that all of this stuff is zero. What's going to happen is that when we run, suppose we run reduction here, right? What is going to happen is this equation, which was, there was like a band of a distance of one in the terms, will now become a distance of two, right? And when we apply reduction here, 
what was a distance of 1 will become a distance of 2 oh. here and same thing for all the others right so we have here And here, and here, and here. Okay, but if you actually focus your attention on only the only the odd numbered ones first, right? So what is going on here? So these guys, if you Focus only on this, this, and this. So we also have this, this, and this. So if you like forget the other columns of the matrix, you see that these are tridiagonal C's. It has the appearance. You see, so there's two, three, and two. It's a three diagonal of three. And the other ones as well. So if we go here, so there's the blue three diagonal system and the red three diagonal system. We have decoupled them, they're independent now. And we can solve them separately. And then you already see why this method is easy to parallelize. Because when we decouple things, it is well, much easier to solve them, right? In, in parallel, because they don't talk to each other. Well, anyway, if we apply reduction again, we have like what is now a step of two between the terms will become a step of four, because it doubles every time. Oops. Okay, then this here, which is a step of four, then there is nothing more because there isn't space for anything, so this guy is already diagonal. This guy is also already diagonal. Oh, and this this one I need to put four two, right? And then this guy before here, and this guy will before. And then, well, we can see now we have uh, four three diagonal systems. Like there's this one, this one, and these two are like three diagonals of only one thing, right? And then if we run reduction one more time, these guys get eliminated, and we have a diagonal system, and we can simply solve, all right? Very very interesting stuff. Okay, so, and then. Like I said, this it is O n log n complexity. It is worse, and you see where the log n comes from, right? Because uh, we need to pass on the matrix. Each pass on the matrix is O n, but we double every time, and then we we finish when this doubling exceeds the size of the matrix, and the amount of doublings that we do is, is proportional to the logarithm of n. That's where the complexity comes from, right? It is worse, but uh, for things that fit in a typical computer's RAM, the difference is pretty much insignificant. And like I said, it has the advantage that it's easily parallelizable. If you have like four cores, you could easily take four times less the time to run this thing, whereas in marching and uh, pure Gaussian elimination, you wouldn't be able to do that. So it is advantageous to use this guy, even though it has worse complexity, right? Well, in any case, let's go to the code. So I'm going to, now it's a C++ code that you can see here. C++ is not like the easiest language to program with, especially with comparison to Python. 
but you can see here that uh, it looks like more or less the same. So we have this signal F, it is the same signal that we've been using like throughout the course. And then so when we start, we sample that signal. Uh, we have here, you see, n equals 100. And then here we have this hits over class, which will take the parameters for the field. And then we, we can look what these are. These are D, the diffusion co coefficient, L, the length where the boundary conditions are applied, and the field, all right, the, to the initial field that we want to pass, okay? And then what we do here, we, we initialize this over with the field, and then we call solve for a time step and this number of divisions and we wanted to output the answer to this ans vector and then it simply prints out the result and you can see here the it uses the crank nicholson method most of this stuff just initializing stuff telling me oh who is alpha who is whatever what is the time step and then you say here we have this struct called three diagonal row so how our implementation works we you see that to do to run this algorithm, we at every time that we next we have only three elements in a row, right? So we have what I call the low element, the mid element, the high element, and there is also the independent one, which is not shown in this matrix because it's in the other one. Okay, and when we double this when we perform the reduction that's still true we have the low one the mid one the high and the independent term right but the the thing that you should be careful though is that this reduction it happens with respect to the rows of the previous matrix so you cannot just like write in place in the matrix because when you're going to perform the reduction for another row, you might pick these uh, new values, which is not the idea. So for this reason, I have like this three diagonal row with the four values I mentioned, and you see that I allocate two, because so I can just put them in one, and then when I run the iteration, I can perform the reduction by coping to the other, other vector, and then when this iteration is done, I don't need this old vector anymore, so I would simply f switch the roles of the vector, right? So this is what this flip variables are. So uh, for m steps, we first do the convolution, which is very easy. It is, it is just a sum, and then we that sum that we always do, and then here the code takes care for the boundary terms, right? And then after this convolution, which is the easy part, we do this flip variable, which indicates which of these vectors we're using as the active one and the one that we should copy to. And then there is some initi initialization with the values that we just convolved. And then here, this is the heart of the cyclic reduction. Maybe I can close the terminal. It is for you to see. Is we set. We set the mid element, say that k equals from 1, k is less than n minus 1, but see, it's not k plus plus, k times equals 2, right, where the log n comes from. And then we set the mid value to the old mid, the independent value to the old independent, and then we see if, we, if it makes sense to look at the i minus k value, we compute the factors and up, update everything, and the same thing for the i plus k. And at the end, I reverse the role of flip, right? And then when k be eventually becomes larger than this, we have a diagonal matrix, and when we just solve the system by dividing everything, and then we set it as the answer, all right? So we can, and to see this in action, I actually have uh, I coded the plot in Python script to because this will actually output to to the terminal and then I have a Python script that picks these values from the terminal and plots it in Python because to set up plotting in C++ it's much more difficult right so we can 
just compile this and then we can just run and pipe it to plot estadine which is the script and then you see here the initial one the one from the fft which is the exact and the one from the c++ code which is a perfect match and then we can also play around with this we can just set this to one and then it will be a bit distorted because it's the crank nico sign so you see there's the distortion that happens with the crack Nicholson method and if we put 4 you, this distortion, the distortion will still be there but smaller you see it is still, you can still see here pretty much the same thing that we simulated in Python but now we coded it ourselves, right? and then when we get to 10 we are sure that it is working, right? Okay, so that's it. That's all for today. We learned how to perform thread diagonal inversion ourselves without any libraries, which is very interesting, I think. And it is also very, very fast. This implementation that I did, it is as fast as the NumPy one. I don't know if NumPy uses this exact algorithm to solve. I suppose it probably uses something more general that is pretty much the same thing this but yeah the since we when we after we have done this we are one step closer to implementing the crank Nicholson methods in anywhere like in, in a graphics card like or whatever because you can see the hard part is just this cyclic reduction stuff and it's actually C code mostly it is not all that complicated once you have set up everything. But in any case, that's all for today, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.